Hey, hey, Rachel, how's it going? Hello, how are you? Uh, I'm all right. How's work? Crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah? Yeah. This random guy, like, tried stealing a case of tequila the other day. <laughs> uh, maybe he just needs hand sanitizer. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, yeah, that's big. That's that's, funny, that's wacky. Yeah, how did he try to do that? Um, he went through the back, like, room. Because there's no door. I mean, there's just like an open door there because that's where we get like the truck. So he just mm -hmm. went back there and then we're like, uh, told one of our managers, like, this man is just trying to steal. But they didn't really like get mad at him. They just said, sir, like, you can't be stealing. Uh, was he wearing a Hawaiian shirt? No, he was not. Oh my God, he didn't even try, dog. I bet you anything oh. if I like walked in through that back door with one of my Hawaiian shirts, they wouldn't even notice. Oh yeah, true. I'll be like, hey, I'm the manager from the Eagle Rock one. We ran out of this. We all, I called in advance. That's true. If you're a Hawaiian shirt, they won't even notice. Yeah, yeah. Um, we went to Trader Joe's on uh, Friday, and it took 90 minutes to get in. What? 90? Yeah, we made the mistake of going there and lining up um, at about, because they open at 9, so we lined up at like 8.45. Uh-huh. And the reason why it took forever well, was that it was one Friday and two, um, there was senior uh, yeah. hours first. Oh, that's true. And they clear the senior line before they clear us. So even though you're supposed to start letting everybody in at nine, we couldn't start going in until like 930 because of how long the senior age line was. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it sucked, but it was fine, to be honest with you, because... Um, uh, we did shopping for like the next three and a half weeks because we have like a bunch of recipes that use um, shelf stable stuff that we like. Um, like, I don't know, fresh pasta sauce um, mm -hmm. and tomatoes keep in the fridge for a real long time so we can plan for meals like that week three. Mm -hmm. uh, we also did grocery shopping for my wife's parents and my one homie who lives downtown who doesn't own a car. Um, because the only place that sells food, like walking distance from his spot, is a CVS dog. Oh. And when you're eating food at CVS, it's just like frozen food and yeah. all this other garbage. Like, I'm afraid that that dude's going to get scurvy, like pirate style, due to lack of oranges. So I'm like, yo, dog, here's some oranges. What's nice of you? Uh, crucial love me. Yeah, yeah. Always make sure that if you have more, you help out your homies who have less because, uh, you make some big bets, things change, and then you're the one who needs help. Yep. Um, hey, y'all. Today we're going to be shifting gears into the next major phase of review. And in my opinion, done with kinematics, done with Newton's laws, that makes us done with what is probably the first half of this class in terms of content, just because that stuff applies everywhere as we move forward. Um, so today I have a two-part review for you, and then this week I want you to know that we will be focusing on energy and momentum. Uh, like my other review lectures where I'm assuming that you like know generally what it is that we're talking about. So it allows me to rephrase these notes in a bigger context. How does this stuff connect to older ideas in physics? How does it connect to later ideas in physics? And how will this stuff be presented to you in college is my like big thing that I want to talk about. Uh, so today for the actual math part of the warm-up, I have a two kilogram block in contact with a surface. And just so you know, this is on Earth, and uh, that's important because it tells us that gravity is equal to 9.81 meters per second squared, uh, which does come into play here. That's not just a red herring. But we're applying a force on here, and keep in mind, a force is a vector. So the force comes inwards at 30 degrees from the horizontal, so the angle from here to there, that's a 30 degree angle. Uh, and it's a magnitude of 7 newtons, and we have friction, mu, equal to 0 0.1. And so this force is going to be applied over a grand total distance of five meters. So what I want to know is, if its initial velocity is zero, what is its final velocity? This is a straightforward numeric question where there is enough information here to use Newton's second law in order to solve for the answer. So draw a free body diagram, use F equals MA, solve for that acceleration, and then once you have the final acceleration, you can use a kinematic equation in order to get that final velocity. The reason why this is our warm-up is that we are also going to do a treatment for this problem, which produces the final answer. But instead, we're going to use it, or we're going to derive it using the work 
energy theorem. And our goal in showing that is that it's gonna give us the same answer and it's gonna give us the same answer in less mathematical steps. It's gonna require less computation. However, I assert that solving this with energy does not give us access to as much information as solving it by this longer method. The goal here is just to compare and contrast when would you use one technique over the other and why? And what kind of information is hidden when we use energy and momentum formulation? Uh, the other part of our warm up today is I just want to talk a little bit about study habits because um, I'm a student as much as I am a teacher. And I just want to make sure that I impart on y'all some knowledge about um, what I found works. Uh, and of course, I'm different than the rest of y'all. We all have different acuities, intelligences, work ethics, etc. I just want to give you something to think about uh, both for how you are going to lay your time out as we get closer to those AP tests and more importantly how you're going to lay your time out when you all go to college next year. Uh, and for this scenario, uh, for item number one of the warm-up, let's just pretend that you have a three-hour chunk to study. More realistically in college you're going to have a bunch of random chunks of time to study when you're just stuck on campus. You're like, oh I have one class that ends at 11. My next class doesn't start until 12.30. Now I have 90 minutes and it's not worth going home for 90 minutes. So I'm just gonna go find a library or a study room or whatever to sit down and get some work done, right? But just for the sake of argument, let's say that you have a big chunk of time all at once. Your time from 5 p.m. until 8 p.m. and there's no class in there anywhere or whatever. How would you study in this time? And we're assuming that you have more than one class. You have like two or three classes. Um, and I will be taking some different scenarios on like your guys' different answers here, and then I'll tell you how I would do it because I definitely um, was doing this wrong when I started college, at least wrong for me, you know? Like I was studying in such a way that it was not very useful. Uh, so I just want to talk about what I found to be good based on a little bit of uh, psychological reading and facts or whatever, I assert that there's like a little bit of evidence behind what I'm gonna assert here. But you know, keep in mind I'm a physics man, not a psychology man. Uh, let's do this part first. So uh, let me get three people before we move along here. If you had three hours to study, if you were like, I'm going to dedicate a three hour chunk to get ready for uh, some upcoming exams, or uh, maybe you have some, because in college, you're going to have a lot of tests that aren't even for classes. Like if you're going to grad school, you'll have the GRE to study for, which is like the SAT. So you'll always have that to look forward to. Or depending on your program, your program might have an exit exam, which means you'll have to study for some sort of comprehensive test. So even when you're not studying for a midterm or final, there's usually still something else to study for, right? So if you had three hours to study, how would you do it? What would you do with your little cuts of time here? Uh, could I get a couple volunteers to offer us some answers? Is it like if we have multiple classes? Yeah, and we're gonna pretend that this is a reasonable college load. Uh, if you guys are part-time in college, you'll have two or three classes. If you're full-time in college, you'll have three or four classes. The reason why there is an or is it depends on whether or not you're going to semester or to quarter. For a quarter school, usually, don't quote me on this, but usually if it's a quarter school, two classes is part-time, three classes or more is full-time. If you're going to a semester school, three classes is part-time, four classes or more is full-time. So in college, unless you're in some special program or you're in your final quarter and you have all of the stuff out of the way, so you're going to take it easy, you'll usually have two to four classes to deal with at any given time. So can I have a volunteer? Like, and I'm not even asking you to like come up with a correct answer. Just right now, as it is, if you were going to study for a three-hour gap, how would you do it? Isn't the most effective ways the like 30 minutes and then five minute breaks? Uh, the big deal is break taking, yeah. And uh, depending on like where you look, who you ask, some people say that like efficacy, the most effective time that you could spend studying, it begins to cap out at around 30. And if you go much past 30 for that second half, uh, past that, your efficiency begins to drop. 
personally, I think I can usually stick in there for about 40 minutes before I begin to space out and stop caring about what I'm doing. But yeah, the reason why I talk about this is please do limit any uh, single stretch of your study time to about 40, 45 minutes. Um, so personally, when I study, because right now I have two classes plus my comprehensive exam that I work on, uh, which is, you know, it's like studying for a third class. Uh, I usually say, okay, so from 5 to 5.45, uh, we're studying. And in this gap, I will deal with whatever I'm studying in class A. Now, this doesn't mean like, oh, I'm just going to do the homework or whatever. That's good. Studying also involves reading in case you are at a level where reading the textbook actually helps you, which takes some building up to. Or maybe even better, you're going to do a few homework questions which are not assigned. Um, that stuff is usually more like what's going to be on the test than the homework itself, right? And then I'm going to take an intentional break here, like a good 20 or 30 minute chunk. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to study some more, uh, do some studying for class B, uh, which would be another 30 minute break. So 30 minutes dedicated to some other class. And uh, the important part is that when you plan out your time, you want to make sure that you like set your breaks aside in advance. So let's say like in this gap, I'm going to play a video game. I'm going to get on to Stardew Valley and I'm going to play one day of Stardew Valley, which is about 25 minutes of game time. This is one of the best ways that you can make sure that you don't accidentally lose a bunch of time to a break by saying, hey, before I take this break to go do something fun, I'm going to set a cutoff time before I even begin. So that instead of falling into Netflix and watching a whole season, you only watch one episode, right? Set an alarm to stop. Do your second chunk of study, take another break. So in here, I would probably go on my run or whatever. I've been trying to run later and later uh, just because exercise is an excellent break from studying. And also there's less people out running at night because people don't know how to share the paths appropriately. And then after that run, I get home, I shower, which this is gonna be a bigger break maybe even a full hour to do like a 40 minute run, 20 minute shower, not a whole 20 minute shower, but like 20 minutes to stretch, cool down and shower. Mm -hmm. And then at the end, I come back for my studying on my comprehensive test C. Mm -hmm. And so in a three hour study chunk, I'm only gonna actually spend about half of it studying. And the psychological research shows that studying like this with these big gaps planned in advance, only doing um, set tasks for a small amount of time, but at a high intensity, right? Like really getting into it, not like studying with one Netflix window open or studying with uh, some garbage on YouTube on autoplay, right? Um, but the amount of content that you can cover studying like this with intentional breaks built in here, you will cover the same amount of content and actually probably cover it at a higher quality than if you were to attempt to study from five to eight while also allowing yourself to goof off. Uh, please do, plan breaks. Uh, is that okay? But like, aren't you gonna be tired after the run? Cause I would like fall asleep. Uh, you know, that's true. It all depends on your endurance. Uh, for me, when I do my daily run, it's like so little compared to my load that it actually usually wakes me up. Oh. Uh, doing a quick run is pretty comparable to like, half a cup of coffee into my blood. Of course, if it's late, I'm gonna be tired and I'm just gonna be tired, but I'm kind of a night owl anyway, so I usually get my best work done at night. Um, it's not as hot at night. Uh, yeah, man, it was nasty hot on Saturday. That was yeah. terrible. Oh. Ugh, yeah, I don't run if it's above 80 degrees, so sometimes in like the summer, I have to wait until nine or 10 to go run. Okay. Yeah, in which case, running is the last thing I do before I go to bed, but that's neither here nor there. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so let's go ahead and figure out what this block is going to do so that we know what our final answer should be based on what we already know. So we're going to start uh, by doing a free body diagram on this guy. And uh, so for this particular two kilogram block on this table, and this is flat, so you know there's no angle to worry about, how many forces are acting on it? Normal force. Mg. Yeah, MG. Okay, so it has its weight. It has an MG. Uh, it also has a normal force, which I'm going to be cautious about writing down because uh, the normal force might not be what you think it is in this case. 
Um, what else? I'm going to put the normal force on last, but it is here. Yeah. It has friction. It has friction. And if we're supposed to be moving to the right, which way is friction going to necessarily point? Left. It's going to have to point left. And friction is usually small. So I'm just going to give it a little vector here just because that mu is small. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be F sub mu acting to the left. Uh, and then what other force is driving this motion? Isn't there um, mg cosine data for the force that's pointing at the 30 degrees? So we have the force which is pointing at the 30 degrees. And for the sake of the free body diagram, that's all that matters is that force itself. So we're going to put it on there and we'll worry about the trig later. So we have a 7 Newton force, our applied force, acting this way. And you're right. In order to know what this is going to do, we're going to have to break it into components with trig. It has a downwards component and it has a forwards component, right? However, please keep in mind that when it comes to free body diagrams, we don't list components. We only list entire forces. So now there's one other force here that I have to list. What is it? Hmm? D. Oh, normal force? This must also have a normal force on it. But please notice this normal force that I'm going to draw is necessarily bigger than the weight. Here's why. Not only do we have the weight acting downwards on the block, this seven Newton force is also going to have a downwards component as well, right? And that downwards component of the seven Newton force will also have to have a responding normal force added to it. Otherwise, the uh, block is going to go through the table. So if you push down on an object which is sitting on a table, the table needs to apply more force backwards in order to stop you from breaking the table itself. Um, and so this right here is our free body diagram. And now we can go ahead and get to applying Newton's laws in order to figure out the sum of the forces. Mr. Robinson, so, yes? if there was no um, friction, then normal force would be the same, right, as mg? No, it doesn't matter whether or not there is friction. If you push down on an object sitting on a table, the normal force responding will have to be larger than just the weight. Okay. It has to be at least the weight, but this normal force in magnitude must be equal to the entire weight plus seven newtons multiplied by the correct component. So uh, if this was 30 degrees mm -hmm. here between the horizontal, that means that this right here would also have to be 30 degrees. And the up-down component is going to be the sine part. So the normal force has to be equal to mg plus 7 sine 30. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Uh, nonetheless, the sum of the forces is going to be equal to m times a. And a uh, real important thing right off the bat, right? Do we have to worry about the forces going up and down? Do we have to worry about the forces in the y direction? Does this, I mean, let's just start off with a little bit of conceptual logic. I have a physics block on a physics table. Is this block going to go up or down? No. No, it's not. It's not going to go up or down. It's not going to fly into the sky. It's not going to smash through the table. Uh, and so that tells us right off the bat that the sum of the forces in the y direction, they must add up to zero. This is zero. And that's actually really easy to justify. That's simply because the normal force uh, minus the weight plus 7 newtons sine 30. All of that adds up to zero. The normal force added with all of the downwards forces, they sum to zero in this scenario by necessity. It's not going to accelerate up. It's not going to accelerate down. So all we're actually considering is the forces left and right. So if we want to know how it moves left and right, we're going to add the forces up left and right, the forces in the x direction. And we have two forces that survive that act left and right. What are our two surviving forces acting left and right? Friction. Yeah, so there's the frictional force to the left, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we're actually going to start with the force moving to the right first, because we're going to call the right direction positive. So the force acting to the right is going to be one component of the seven Newton force. 
So that's going to be 7 newtons multiplied by cosine 30. We want the adjacent side. So the only force driving us forward is going to be the cosine component of that 7 newton applied force. And then friction is going to try and stop us. So we're going to have to subtract from this the force due to friction, which is going to be mu multiplied then by the normal force. Is this OK? OK, so I'm going to do 7 cosine 30, um, which yeah, which cosine is uh, root 2 over 2, but I'm just going to turn it into a decimal. So this is going to be equal to 6.06 .06 newtons minus mu, which was given in the problem. That's just a decimal, 0 0.01 in this case. This is a very, very smooth surface. Then we have to multiply it by the normal force. And how much normal force is there? More than mg. <laughs> that is correct. It is more than mg. Normally on a flat surface, the normal force is just mg. So for normal force, we get very accustomed to just plugging in mg. But like I said, in this case, if you push downwards on an object, if you push an object against a table with some additional weight on top of it, it is going to increase the amount of interaction between those two surfaces. And as a result, there will be more frictional force. Not because it's changing mu, but because it is changing the applied normal force coming back on the surface from the table. So this is going to be equal to mg plus the sine part of the 7 newton force. So it'll be mg plus 7 newtons times sine 30, where, of course, mg in this case is uh, 2 kilograms times 9.81. So I'll write that in the next line, 6.06 .06 newtons minus 0 0.01 times two kilograms times 9.81 meters per second squared plus seven newtons sine 30. So I'm going to go ahead and just feed that to a calculator because at that point we're in decimal land. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be uh, 0 0.01 times the quantity of two times 9.81 minus seven sine 30, which is uh, one half. Mm -hmm. But, you know, process it all at once. So all in all, as this process goes along, friction is going to apply 0 0.1612 newtons worth of force in the backwards direction as this thing drives forward. And so that will give us the sum of the forces acting left and right. And so the magnitude of the left and right forces is going to be equal to 6.06 .06 minus 0 0.1612 for a total sum of forces equal to 5.89. Uh, and you know what, we'll leave it. Yeah, actually we would round up because that next zero or the next value is an eight. Mm -hmm. So we'll do 5.90 Newtons after we consider sig figs. Uh, now, are we done? Is this the complete answer? Is this what the question was asking for? No. No, what did we want to know? Final velocity. Yeah, and the reason why we're showing this is just to show that uh, Newton's second law, what it's really giving us is the sum of the forces. From the sum of the forces, we apply Newton's second law and get F equals MA so that we can get the acceleration. So now we can do that. So this will give us 5.90 Newtons is equal to MA, uh, which is going to be 2 kilograms times A. And so our acceleration here is just going to be 5.9 divided by 2. 2.9. The acceleration experienced by this block under these forces is going to be equal to 2.95 meters per second squared. However, here's what we wanted. We wanted the final velocity after this system is allowed to evolve over a distance of 5 meters. Mm -hmm. So how do we do that? Use the third kinematic equation. We are going to use the time-independent equation of motion because time was not given and time was not asked. And so v squared is equal to v sub o squared plus 2a delta x. v sub o is 0, given in the diagram. The initial velocity is 0, so there's nothing to worry about there. And so our final velocity is going to be equal to the square root of 2 times the acceleration times the distance over which this system evolves 
And so the final velocity of this block after all this work is going to be equal to the square root of two times 2.95 meters per second squared times a distance of five meters, which is the distance over which this can evolve. Hot pro tip from a physicist, you know that you've done the right thing, probably, like every now and then what I'm about to say fails due to coincidence, but you probably got the question right if your answers in the final step are right. What units would you get here? What's meters per second squared times meters? Meters per second. Uh, once you take the square root, yeah. So this is asking us for the square root of meters okay. squared per second squared. Mm -hmm. The squares and the square roots would cancel, and this would just give us back meters per second, which is what we would expect since this is a velocity. And so the final velocity of this block after it's allowed to evolve is going to be 2.95 times 2 times 5, then square rooted for a final answer of 5.4, 3 meters per second. Um, and just so that we know, this information also would let us write the complete equation of motion for this system over time. Uh, and just so y'all know what that would look like, x is going to be equal to one half a t squared plus v sub o t plus x sub o. I said the initial velocity was zero, so this whole piece here gets zeroed out. And so x minus x sub o, which is the same as saying the displacement, this is going to be equal to one half times the acceleration on the system, where the acceleration was 2.95 meters per second squared to the right, then multiplied by t squared, where this acceleration is from Newton's laws, right? This is from f equals ma. And this equation right here would constitute the entire equation of motion for this block forever, because it has no motion up or down. An x equation is sufficient. This is the total equation of motion for that block. Uh, are there any questions on either part of today's warm-up? No. No? Okay. Um, and so today we're going to do our quick breakdown of uh, how you should think about and strategize using conservation of energy and conservation of momentum in your brain. Um, and for this week, there will be two homework assignments. There's going to be the unit or FRQ, which is conservation of energy. And there's also going to be the unit 5 FRQ, which is conservation of momentum. I'm going to assign both, and both of them are going to be, you'll have two days for each of them. So I'll assign unit 4 FRQ today, which means it will be taken Wednesday, and then I'll assign unit 5 FRQ to go over Friday. So today, tomorrow, we're going to be doing general review. And then on, uh, yeah, Wednesday, we'll look at the unit 4 FRQ and begin working through it. And then Friday, we'll begin the unit 5 FRQ and begin working through it. So both of those will go up on College Board Classroom and be live uh, available today. Uh, OK. Conservation laws. And before we move along, are there any other questions about the class in general? We all good? Just in a review mode to get ready for this test in a month or so? Uh, less than a month. Two weeks? Three weeks? Two and a half weeks? Yeah. Okay. So here's what's big. Uh, both of the conservation laws that we need to know about, they both have some details, but in reality, both of them are actually just Newton's second law. I'm sorry, Newton's third law. So if you take Newton's laws, Newton's third law, the one that says every force has an equal and opposite reaction force. If you take Newton's uh, third law and you multiply it by distance, I'm sorry, that is not the best way to put that. If you take it and you multiply it by distance, you multiply it by delta x, this will actually produce for you the work energy theorem. And if you take Newton's third law and you multiply both sides by time, this gives you the momentum impulse theorem.
And here's why both of these things interest us. Both of these things are quantities which we consider to be conserved, right? This is to say that the amount of this stuff before and the amount of this stuff after are both going to be equal to each other. And because the difference is zero, that allows us to use that information in order to write an equation. That equation can give us information about final states in a way that is quicker and easier than using Newton's laws in conjunction with kinematics. Now, what you should know is that um, just basic definition of conservation, conserved quantities, uh, remain constant in total, which is why we can use these equations at all. The use of a conservation equation will give us the same solution as mechanics. I'm sorry, the same solution as kinematics. That is to say, like we did in the warm up, that's the long way of solving that question. If you figure out the acceleration by adding up the forces and let it evolve over time, it'll give you the same final answer However, both of these methods, the act of using uh, conservation laws, uh, this does not provide information about time evolution. Which is dangerous because if you're asked about what this system was doing in the middle, it can't give you that. Conservation laws can only tell you what a system was doing before and what it's going to be doing at the very end of motion, which is to say that we can use Newton, I'm sorry, we can use conservation of energy to show that in this situation, the final uh, velocity of the block would be 5.43 meters per second. This can come from conservation of energy, but this cannot. This is called time evolution, an equation of motion that shows what your system is going to do as a function of time. Momentum laws and energy laws cannot give you equations of this nature. They do not describe time evolution. They only describe final states. Okay. Uh, so before we even get into the equations, because the equations um, we've used a lot and they're on your equation sheet, I wanna talk about the cases in which these two are used, uh, some fine points and some details. Um, the work energy theorem is used, uh, I'm sorry, let's start off with units. The work energy theorem is measured out in units of joules, which since work is force multiplied by distance, that means joules is the same as a Newton multiplied by a meter, a Newton meter, um, and this is also the same as, because we could take a Newton and break it up, a kilogram meters per second squared times meters. You could put those two meters together with meters equals kilograms meter squared per second squared. Now, um, this is neat, uh, just because it's always good to unit check yourself as you move along. Uh, these are all the equivalents of joules, but if you were asked for a certain amount of energy at the end of a relationship, that answer should be joules. Uh, momentum, for whatever reason, which we all know is mass times velocity, is just kilogram meters per seconds, and for whatever reason, uh, this has no name. It's just a kilogram meter per second, usually because momentum on its own is not useful to us, Momentum is a way that we can um, calculate final states in certain scenarios, but there's no measuring device or whatever that I could say, hey, this device measures momentum. No, the only way to get the momentum of an object is to measure its velocity, which we can do with a motion detector, or if uh, there's a cop behind you on the freeway, they're using a speedometer to do it, right? Um, and then to get the momentum, you then take that velocity and multiply it by mass. There are ways that you can measure energy, pure and independent of your system. Uh, momentum cannot be measured pure and independent of the system. Uh, other important footnotes before we keep going along here is that momentum is a vector while work and energy are scalars. Yeah? Yep. Okay. 
Um, and both of these are used in two main cases that you want to look out for on the test. There's like a red flag that you are actually being signaled to use one of these two formulations. If you are being asked to use momentum impulse, this is probably the most obvious thing. There is some sort of collision. That is to say, there is the interaction of two separate objects hitting each other or bouncing. And you have to keep in mind that uh, this math is symmetric, whether or not time plays out forward or time plays out backwards. So this could take a couple different looks. Um, it could be that you have two objects that hit and stick. So uh, I have a ball go into a block of clay. And then this system becomes this. And you're being asked, hey, what does this do over time? What kind of collision would that be? Elastic. This would be inelastic. Mm -hmm. And this would be a case of momentum only. Mm -hmm. However, the place where this can get a little bit sticky is that keep in mind that if you play this picture in reverse, it's still an inelastic equation. So if I have pieces of a grenade and that grenade explodes, it's exactly the same as this, but played in reverse. So instead of it being multiple objects that collide and become one object and move together, if you let that video play in reverse and I have two, one object moving and then it blows apart into two objects, that is also technically an inelastic collision and it can also be solved by these, uh, this particular formulation here on the right. The other type of collision would be that I have a ball A and a ball B Ball A collides into ball B, and then in the future, ball A has been sent backwards with some high speed, and ball B has been set in motion to the right with some small speed. This is an elastic collision. And as we learned, we learn about energy first because the solution of an elastic collision requires momentums and energy. It requires both sets of equations. You take one and substitute it into the other. Uh, the place where work and energy apply, where we're interested in using this formulation, are places where you have conservative forces. And uh, the hardest part that I had in coming up with today's uh, lecture is coming up with a way to clearly define conservative forces. And I don't like any of the definitions for high school of what a conservative force is because they're all basically circular, man. A conservative force is a force which conserves energy, which I think is garbage. Um, yeah, here's a better way to think about it, though to fully get this definition, you need to understand a little bit of thermodynamics. A conservative force is a force which does not bleed energy off in the form of heat. So friction is not a conservative force. Once you put work into friction, you cannot then get any of that energy back out of the system. It has become heat. And once it has become heat, it just bleeds off and becomes part of the universe, becoming absolutely unreclaimable. Conservative forces are places where we can put energy in and then get it back later. So here's one of the classicest examples of a conservative force that we all live under. I'm doing work on this pen, and now that I have done work on this pen, I can let it go, and it's gonna be pulled back down. What is pulling it back down? Gravity. Gravity. Gravity, Gravity is one of the best examples of a conservative force. I can do work against it. I can apply a force over a distance to put potential energy in here, and once this has been instilled with this potential energy, and I let it go, that potential energy re-expresses itself as kinetic energy. Hey, Mr. Rob? Yes? Wait, like, so is that why with gravity, you could make like that really big battery, since like gravity is a conservative force, you could get that like energy back, or is this unrelated? No, this is absolutely related, and I believe this is the, uh, assuming humans are still around in 10 years, uh, this is the necessary future of the energy economy, simply because it's like, when we look at future technologies, you, you have lots of different uh, hopes and goals or whatever, 
But one thing that a lot of technologies miss is being scalable, right? So it's like one thing to come up with a fusion reactor. That's dope as hell. Like, hey, look, we made a star, we put it in a bottle, and now this thing powers my city, right? I would assert that even though it's cool and it might be important for future tech, it's not that useful of a technology simply because it may or may not be scalable. Like, what if you can only build that facility in a certain area, a certain situation? Materials are rare, that stuff doesn't matter. So part of like solving the world's energy needs also requires that these solutions be things that we can easily build anywhere, which is why uh, this type of gravity battery is like tight and perfect. So the way that this thing works, and y'all are looking at this tower of blocks, right? Yeah. Is that you make one of these towers, right? And this thing operates all on its own according to like a pretty simple computer algorithm. And what it's doing is that when additional energy is produced by some sort of renewable energy source, the big one is solar, because solar power is only available during the day. So if you want to heat your house at night with solar power, mm -hmm. you need to store that energy somewhere. Each one of the blocks in this uh, gravity battery is going to have an associated potential energy on it of MGH. So the mass of the block, the heavier the block, the better, multiplied by gravity, which you can't change, multiplied by H, the height, which means the higher you lift a given block, the better, right? That is the number of joules of energy that will be stored in each one of those blocks. So during the day, the uh, motors turn, and it's going to lift these blocks up and stack them up, stack them up, stack them up, stack them up in the form of this tower. So at night, when your house gets cold and you want that energy back, you attach the block to the winch and allow it to fall naturally. The motor that is at the top there, and this is true of all motors, all motors act as generators and all generators act as motors. If you put energy into a generator, it's going to turn the crank. And if you turn the crank externally, it's going to put energy or sorry, allow electricity to flow out of the motor, right? Mm -hmm. So the thing that is the motor will also generate electricity if you force it to operate in reverse. Uh, so at night, you attach a block, and as it slowly falls, the energy generated by that motor can then, you know, power your house. Um, and I don't bring this up just because that's a really good question, and this is a really good application of the simple equation, MGH, potential energy uh, due to gravity, but because these types of... Um, energy questions, which I don't know, is this starting to feel a little bit like environmental science? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it is possible for the AP test to ask a round trip energy question about something like this, like, hey, here's a hydroelectric plant, tell us about the energy going on here. Though I doubt that they would ask that type of question this year simply because of the restructure. Uh, is that okay? Yeah. Are any of these in LA? Huh? Are there any of these in LA? These don't really exist anywhere yet in a big oh. way. Um, even though the technology is hella basic, it would be super simple um, to do this. You just need the money to construct it and the land space to store it. Um, the main way in which this stuff is used, um, and even though it seems different, it's not. The thing I'm about to show you is the exact same technology, just a little bit more pliable, uh, is called pumped hydro. Um, which is like a hydroelectric plant, right? Y'all have seen hydroelectric plants before, like a waterfall falls, and then yeah. that waterfall turns a windmill, or yeah. sorry, turns a, a water wheel. Yeah. Pumped hydro is that exact thing. The only difference is at night, the turbine is, I'm sorry, during the day when you're making extra electricity, the pump is used to pump water uphill. So if you are making extra electricity during the day when the solar panels are on, you turn the pump on and it pumps the water uphill. And then at night when you want the energy back, you open the gates and then allow that energy to flow back downhill through the slough and pump water uphill, store energy, allow water to flow downhill, collect energy. So right now in this little graphic, that's storing energy. And then when it flows back through, that generates electricity for your town to use. Um, Pumped hydro is responsible for almost a third of the energy storage in Germany right now. Um, and of these two options, if you were going to build one for us, right, and not necessarily LA, but like Pasadena and all those outlying areas, I would say you'd have to do an ecological study to see how it would affect Angeles National Forest, because those mountains go right up against national land. 
But yo, with all those hills up there, it would be an excellent place to install or to consider installing pumped hydro. Uh, but yeah, pumped hydro, gravity battery, they're one and the same. It's just a matter of whether or not the thing that you're lifting up is a giant hunk of concrete, in which case it's a gravity battery, or if the thing that you're lifting up is water, but it's the same. You lift it up, stores energy using gravity, drop it down, releases energy using gravity. Uh, and that means that for both of these, the conservation of energy statement is the same. Uh, what the conservation of energy says is that the, and this is only under conservative forces, but under conservative forces, the mechanical energy is equal to the sum of two different types of energy. Mechanical energy must be equal to potential energy plus kinetic energy, where potential energy is energy that you can store and get back using a conservative force. So, and I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, I think the conservative forces we have access to in this class are gravity and springs. I don't think you have access to any other conservative forces because this is high school. I'm gonna think as hard as I can, but I think literally every single conservative force that we have dealt with in the lab or in a question or that you could see on a test is gravity or springs. And if you can think of another one, I will give you a dollar through Venmo. <laughs> I don't think we have. But... Yeah, I don't think there are others. Now don't get me wrong, in real life, there are a ton of freaking conservative forces. Electricity constitutes a conservative force. Magnetism constitutes a conservative force. The strong force and the weak force, they both con constitute conservative forces. And depending on various situations, we invent forces that don't exist that can be modeled as conservative in order to use those forces to get correct answers. However, you're not responsible for that. Nonetheless, here's the lesson. While energy is conserved, this right here, is the conserved quantity. Conserved, it doesn't change. How much ever mechanical energy was in the scenario at the beginning is the amount of mechanical energy that will be in the scenario at the end. So if this number itself is a constant, calculus kids, that means the derivative is zero, but you don't need that for this year, you need that next year. And that means that if potential energy goes up, if you store additional potential energy in an object, what happens to this other number? Also goes up. No, not if this is constant. Oh, then it decreases. Yeah, yeah, this goes down. So if the mechanical energy is conserved, if, if potential energy goes up by 10 joules, kinetic energy necessarily has to go downwards by 10 joules. And if the potential energy goes down, if this number decreases, that means the kinetic energy goes up. This is why as an object falls, its potential energy goes down and it speeds up, speeds up, speeds up, speeds up. But if you take an object and you throw it upwards, the higher it goes, the more kinetic energy it has. But as an object goes up, it slows down, slows down, slows down, stops, right? Because as it goes up, as the potential energy increases, it must slow down. The kinetic energy decreases. Now, this conservation only is true in the absence of external forces. So what I'm about to say is true for both of these. Conservation is only true uh, if and only if the sum of external forces is zero So this is to say that when you're dealing with collisions, conservation only works if the collision itself is the only force. If you are talking about two pool balls colliding and for whatever reason, those two pool balls are also on a tilted table and there's friction, the conservation equation won't work. Or if there are external forces here where we're talking about conservation of mechanical energy, if there's extra forces, that won't work either. That is to say that if I'm uh, loading a spring inside of a Nerf gun, uh, but also there's a ton of friction on the spring, or if I throw an object up and I want to deal with conservation of energy there, but there's also air resistance, the addition of those external forces will mess everything up. However, these external forces will act in a way that we can calculate, which is where our theorems come into play. 
if you have external forces and you are dealing with momentums, an external force multiplied over a certain amount of time, F delta T, that's called what? Impulse. That's impulse. An external force applied over a certain amount of time will give us a change in momentum of the system. External forces over time change momentum. Or if I have an external force applied on an object over a specific distance, F delta X, this will give us a change in kinetic energy, which I used to write kinetic energy is one half mv squared. But as we learned from the later part of the book, kinetic energy has another form if the object is rotating. So a uh, quick breakdown. Conservation laws, very common in science. It means a number doesn't change, which allows us to write an equation and set it equal to zero. Energy and momentum are our two conserved forces. They have different units, joules, and in the case of momentum, some nameless thingy. One of them is a scalar. Energy is a scalar term. Momentum is a vector term, and so they provide for us different types of information. The conservation of energy tells us that potential energy and kinetic energy one conserved, one is exchanged for the other. And then when it comes to momentum, that is our language for collisions. If you have two objects collide into each other and hit each other and stick, or hit each other and collide, or in the rare third case of an object blowing apart into several pieces, that is a key that you should be using momentum. And if there are any external forces, that is to say the act of setting something in motion, or an extra force being added in to interrupt what we're doing, that's where we have to use our work energy theorem. Force times distance, this is work. And work will change the amount of energy available in a system. Force times time is impulse. And impulse will change the amount of momentum in a system. When we come back tomorrow, we'll have both the unit 4 FRQ and the unit 5 FRQ assigned online with deadlines. And tomorrow we're going to solve the same equation that we solved in part two of today's warm up, that little block with the friction acting on it. But instead of solving it out with kinematics, we are instead going to solve it out using conservation of energy. We'll be able to assign a work uh, setup there and we'll show that the final velocity is the same in much, much less work, way less formulation. Are there any questions on what we're doing today or really for the rest of the week? Are there any questions out there? We're just like reviewing, right? Yep, just reviewing. And then uh, the days after the uh, FRQs are due, we'll do the tutorials for them. Okay. Yeah, that's going to be our whole thing that we do until the end. Oh, yeah, and one other thing. I talked a bunch last Friday about the uh, lab book final assignment. I'm going to post it today. And I did think about it. If you just want to submit a video of you, like, flipping through the notebook to show me that it's all, like, done and ready to go, that's fine. Okay. Um, Okay, so y'all have a nice day, and I'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Y'all, go get some exercise, y'all. Don't, like, become potato. Like, do a <laughs> yoga, get the Nike Training Club app, as I'm going to keep reminding y'all, because you got to stay fit, man. True. Peace. Mm -hmm. No potato. Yeah, man, exercise is a pure oh. virtue.